It is Bloomberg, the year ahead. You think about 2020 and the year behind. 2021, what is it, 20 some, 30 some, 40 some days into it? It has been an adventure. For our institutions worldwide, it has been extraordinary as they adapt and adjust. Kristalina Georgieva is the managing director at the International Monetary Fund, and she brought to the institution a decades, multiple decades history of adapting and adjusting. We're thrilled she could join us for her 2021. Dr. Gorgieva, thank you so much for joining Bloomberg today. What I really want to talk about first off is your theme that game theory is not about individualism, every nation for itself, as Ian Bremmer would talk about. We need to get into this together, get through it together, and get out of it together. How can the IMF assist? We are bringing our 190 members together uh, last year to come up swiftly with the right policies for this very unusual crisis. And this year, to march together for the recovery uh, from it. There is good news. Uh, we now have vaccines and uh, monetary and fiscal policy have done their job to put a floor under the world economy. But we also are under the thick clouds of uncertainty. And what we look into uh, for the next year are first the race between a mutating virus and multiple vaccines. Second, the resolve of policymakers not to withdraw support prematurely. We have to see the health crisis in the review mirror before we do that. And three, a re-energized global cooperation so we can vaccinate people everywhere as fast as possible and we can bring the uh, global economy up right. for a more um, profoundly effective recovery rather than the uneven recovery, unfortunately, we foresee. I think, Dr. Goryeva, my good friend David Malpass, now at the World Bank, would suggest you are more qualified than anyone in the world to understand the systems analysis, the processes of, say, the World Bank or the EU, and now at the IMF, of getting the job done. What are we not doing right now that we need to turn around and do correctly? Well, the uh, uh, very first uh, uh, we, fo we need to focus on is... Uh, a recognition that vaccine policy is an economic policy and that only vaccinating everybody everywhere would get us out of the risk of this mutation that we have already seen uh, threatening the uh, uh, hopes for accelerated recovery. Uh, and that is possible. Not only it is possible, it is in the interest of everyone. Uh, we did a calculation at the IMF that um, if vaccination is indeed accelerated around the world, we would get $9 trillion bigger global income, and that $9 trillion between now and 2025 will be split 60-40 between emerging markets, developing economies, mm -hmm. and the advanced economies. So it is a great value for money action from advanced economies to give a helping hand to the developing well, uh, world. You've got uh, and such the second a issue... No, please, go ahead. Please, Dr. Gorgieva, go ahead. And, and the second uh, uh, issue that we need to zero in on is uh, something that uh, uh, I'm, I'm very, very concerned about. It is a growing divergence within countries and across countries. What yes. we see is that parts of the economy, high-tech, digital, no-contact manufacturing, is doing extremely well. And people there are flourishing. 
and parts mm -hmm. of the economy in the contact dependent uh, uh, sectors, low skilled workers, women, young people, minorities, they're doing very badly. When you take this problem globally, advanced economies are pulling out of this crisis much faster. Poor mm -hmm. countries are falling behind. <clears throat> uh, Tom, for the first time in decades, poverty is going up, hunger well. is going up. 50% of the developing countries that used to converge in income levels are now diverging. In other words, they're falling, falling behind. So why we should worry about that everywhere? Because we count on developing economies for dynamic growth. If they don't grow, bad for right. people there, oh. bad for the world economy. Kristalina, what I think is so important here, and I, I really want to draw the attention, the specificity of the IMF research of the 45 nations of Africa. I would suggest that data, cases, deaths, hospitalizations, just societal effect in Africa is the story for 2021, for February, even for June or July of 2021. What do we need to do to assist a poorer Africa to come to a constructive outcome? We have three levers and we can act upon using each and every one of them. The first one is to recognize that Unfortunately, infections are going up in, in Africa. Yes, youthful population, but they are also impacted. And we saw the South African uh, mutation of the virus a threat globally, not just for uh, South Africa and Africa. Making sure that we have vaccines accessible and that health systems in Africa are being reinforced so they can deliver vaccination because a vaccine shot is only good when it makes it in the arm. And that means nurses and doctors transportation capacity. So this is number one, prioritize support mm -hmm. for health systems and vaccination in Africa. Two, recognize that the African economies are severely impacted by the economic uh, crisis. Uh, tourism dependent, uh, oil dependent right. economies, especially severely. Uh, the numbers are really staggering. Uh, this year, uh, 21, we expect Africa to grow only just slightly over 3%. When we project for the rest of the world, 5.5%. Mm -hmm. Last year, Africa shrunk for the first time in decades, 3% uh, reduction. Now, why that should bother us? Because Africa should be growing 6, 7, 8, 10% to pull people out of uh, uh, poverty, to create conditions for more security. So we need to think of more grants and more concessional finance for Africa and also work harder to make it so that low interest rates in the rest of the world make it as financial flows at right. low rates in Africa. And I three, believe, and... I, I think it's so important here to ask the obvious question, Dr. Gorgieva, which is where is the financials and the cash call right now to assist Africa and, frankly, to assist the rest of the world through this natural disaster. Are you, are you I mean, I, I look at the four years that you had with President Trump, and now you have a massive change, I would respectfully suggest, in Washington mm -hmm. with President Biden. How do you feel about going to world leaders and saying, this is a Gorgieva theory, this is what we need to do, give me a multilateral check, is a check in the mail? <laughs> Uh, I actually feel fairly optimistic because there is this revitalization of global cooperation uh, on the horizon for two reasons. One is because the pandemic has made us all more sober about our interdependence. And second, because we do have a very strong signal from our largest shareholder from the United States 
that we are going to work more uh, together uh, from uh, climate to helping uh, developing uh, countries in this crisis. Uh, last year, we made the call to our membership to massively increase our concessional lending capacity. And the membership, for fairness to all, responded to this call. So we have provided financial uh, lifelines to 85 countries. 49 are low-income countries. We actually were there for Africa. Uh, uh, Tom, I got calls uh, last year from leaders in Africa. They would express such deep appreciation for the speed and the size of the financial support right. we provided uh, uh, to these countries. Mm -hmm. This year, you ask me what is the, the, the Georgiev call for 21. My call for 21 is lean forward, we have to do more. We ought to look into ways in which we expand further the concessional uh, capacity of the IMF we are engaging with our members on that. Uh, it means to get more special drawing rights that are already in existence. Uh, there are some that are um, on the view that, that going for, for additional SDR allocation uh, would be timely. And uh, I see this as a, uh, a possibility to be explored. Mm -hmm. Why? Because New SDR allocation provides extra liquidity to countries that have no access to markets. Those who are questioning the validity of a new allocation say, wait a minute, 60% would go to countries that don't need right. it. But at this point of time, I think we need to concentrate on the benefit of increasing capacity of poor countries to cope with this once-in-a-century right. pandemic, once-in-a-lifetime economic uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. And if I may, my third point, I said we have three Please. levers. May, let me go to the third one, which is debt. Many African countries are under a mountain of debt. It has gone up since the beginning of this crisis. Thankfully, the, uh, G7, the, uh, the G7, the G20 have advocated for action, and now we have debt service suspension for low-income countries. But it expires in April. So my plea is for us to look for ways in which we can expand the space for these countries to cope right. with the crisis as a priority. <clears throat> The same way we say in advanced economies, now is not the time to think about that interest rates are low. Uh, make sure that you you protect your economy and your people. We have to do the same well, for poor countries. And, and Dr. Gorgiev, in the time we've got left, in a good six minutes that we have left with you, I think it is so important not to dovetail what's going on within market shocks within the United States or this, that, and the other thing. But this unique economic experiment of a massive central bank accommodation and the new fiscal economics of this natural disaster. And I want to go back to your MIT economics of years ago, where you dovetailed environmental economics into the traditional classical, neoclassical economic response. Do we know where we're going with this massive accommodation and with this massive fiscal buildup? Uh, what has been done over this last year was the appropriate policy response to this very unusual crisis. We asked the economy to stand still, producers not to produce, consumers not to consume, and to be able to survive, to prevent massive bankruptcies and unemployment, it was and it continues to be appropriate to have accommodative monetary policy. Low interest rates, they're going to stay low for some time to come. And then use these low interest rates also for some fiscal expansion that has given lifelines to businesses and has protected the uh, most vulnerable in society 
from a uh, real severe harm. Now, when we look forward, there are two very important lessons we need to take with us. The first one is that accommodation needs to continue, but there would be time when good news will translate into less support, gradual withdrawal of this support, and we have mm -hmm. to be ready. Uh, we know that last year the bankruptcy rates were lower than, than historically they would be. Uh, so we would see some companies exiting, and we have to make sure that our uh, banking system, our supervisory authorities uh, are ready to, to prevent this from being uh, damaging to the economy and to society. And then we need to say, OK, as we continue to provide some support, can we target it better for the dynamic growth of tomorrow? And the answer is yes, we can. We can support a green investment mm -hmm. push that would reorient the economy. So on the other side of the, of the crisis, it is greener, Hopefully, it is also more equitable uh, economy. That green investment push is going to generate also mm -hmm. growth in the job jobs that are necessary to compensate for automation and for the impact of the crisis. The beauty of green is that it can be job rich, uh, reforestation, uh, buildings, well, renovation to reduce emissions, okay. emissions, all of this is good for jobs uh, as it is good for growth okay. and it is good then for I, our planet. And then as we close out here, Dr. Gorgieva, then I have to ask the tough question here is what leadership can the IMF provide to the great polluter China is they desperately want to be green. There's no question. We've seen it in all the books that are out there. Dan Jurgen's book, The New Map, was my book of the year last year. All of it's great, except we've got to get China on board with the Biden administration to begin to solve the pollution of the Pacific Rim. How can the IMF affect that? Uh, by engaging uh, with China through our Article 4 consultations, concentrating on mitigation, reducing carbon emissions, uh, and concentrating on carbon price, gradually increasing to provide the incentive for businesses to, ch to change uh, from brown to green, and also by engaging globally on this topic of shifting mm -hmm. towards the new climate economy. So countries that are interacting with China, choose this right path that is a win, 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 win. It's good for growth, for jobs, for health, and of course, for our planet. Well, I've got we one minute are left. embracing I, that. I know you're embracing that. I want to embrace a difficult question. I want you to speak right now, Kristalina Gorgieva, to a significant part of the public that's not anti-vaccine, but they're afraid to get that first shot. They're afraid to get that second shot. What has the IMF learned about the courage needed to get out there and get the vaccine? First, I got my first shot. I will soon get my second shot. Uh, so uh, acting on my belief just in front of you today, uh, but also to recognize that uh, uh, unless we put this crisis, health crisis to bed, we are not going to see mm -hmm. our economies and our lives uh, to go in the direction we dream of. You want to hug your children. You want to hug your grandchildren. Let's put this crisis to bed.